questions so far? <laughs> All right, so I want to welcome everybody to the Pulmonary Wellness and Rehabilitation Center. If it's your first time, welcome. If it's not your first time, welcome anyway. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the way that I lecture for just 30 seconds. So I don't want this to be a lecture. So for those of you that have been here before, you know that I want this to be a discussion. So do not be afraid to jump in. If you have something to say or if you have a question, you're not going to throw me off, okay? As you can tell, um, you know, if, if we get into something, okay, I will say this as I say every time, 90% of what I know about pulmonary disease I've learned from my patients, okay? So I'm sure that this group of people has as much to teach me as I have to teach you. Don't be afraid by that because I've been to classes where people say that and then that's really true, okay? But I'm gonna to try to teach tonight, okay? But if you have something you wanna say, jump in. If you have a question, jump in, because I promise you, if you have that question, everybody has the question. And this is the second in a, a monthly series. So this is a continuum, okay? It's not like if you don't get it tonight, you're not gonna get it, because we repeat things over and over again. Because to me, the best patient is a well-informed patient. Okay? And the healthiest patient is usually the, the, the well-informed patient as well. So don't be afraid to jump in if you have any questions. Okay? Um, next order of business, the handout. Okay? I'm in the process of writing a book right now called Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness, which is going to be for my patients. Okay? It's a culmination of my 20 years of work in, in pulmonary care. Now here's the thing. Don't feel like you have to memorize this. Okay? Some of the feedback from the last lecture was that people wanted a handout. So I'm giving this to you as a guide, okay? There's information in here, you're welcome to look it over. If the lecture gets boring, you're welcome to read it, okay? <laughs> but if, okay? Now here's the thing, if you have questions about anything in here, by all means, ask, okay? What I envision at some point is a website where, as an example, if it says, biological system responsible for gas exchange, and you say, hey, what's gas exchange? You can click on gas exchange and see a definition of gas exchange. We talk about this all the time, but one of the big problems with the medical system, okay, and the healthcare system is that it's fast paced, okay? You have little time with your healthcare practitioners who are seeing a lot of patients per day and they don't always have time to spend with you, teaching you, okay? And so very often people come in here with very serious diagnoses, taking serious medications and having no clue what's going on with them. Luckily, besides taking care of the fish, I don't have much to do here during the day, and that gives me plenty of time to educate people and try to get people on board with what we do in terms of ultimate pulmonary wellness. So, little recap, okay? Last week we talked about the components of pulmonary wellness, or ultimate pulmonary wellness. And what we talked about, and I'll just refresh them, okay? From an 18% each, okay? 18% medical and by medical I mean having the right doctor okay and that is a discussion in itself as to what does it mean having the right doctor taking the right medications and taking them properly okay taking them properly could mean taking them in the right order taking them at the right times but one of the ironies about pulmonary medications is that for the group of people that have the greatest difficulty coordinating their breathing most of the devices that you take medications out of for pulmonary disease require a lot of coordination of breathing. And so often, the medication is not gotten, okay? Next month, we're gonna have a physician, an attending physician from New York, Medi uh, New York uh, Cornell University, um, who, uh, Dr. Dana Zapetti, who's gonna be talking about proper medication use. Okay, that's gonna be a great lecture. So 18% of pulmonary wellness, medical. So right doctor, okay? Right medications, taking the medications properly. 18% exercise, okay? You know that exercise is crucial in terms of building up your body and preventing shortness of breath and reversing shortness of breath. 18% nutrition, and by nutrition, I mean eating healthy but being at the right weight. Not being overweight, not being underweight. 18% stress management and relaxation training, okay? As you know, having a chronic disease can be a very anxiety provoking, especially one where the number one symptom is shortness of breath. So in the sense that if I don't know how to swim, I'm not going in the pool, okay? 
And for people who have trouble breathing, if I don't know if I can make it to the store and back without losing my breath and keeling over, which is what I think many people's fear is, then I'm not going to the store, okay? Same thing with going to the theater. Same thing with going out to dinner, okay? So these are the things we want to help you with. So stress management, anxiety management, relaxation training, because you know what stress does to the body, okay? The stress chemical, adrenaline, remember what it says to you? Breathe, 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 breathe. So if you're short of breath, the last thing you want is someone saying, breathe, 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 breathe. Okay, so we're gonna teach you how to quiet that down. 18% prevention of infection, okay? It's a lot easier to prevent an infection than to deal with the consequences once you've got it. So what I mean by that, healthy hands start here, okay? We talked about this. Hand washing is the number one thing that you can do to prevent infection because how do you get an infection? <laughs> Hi, my name is Noah. Okay? That's how you do it. Okay? So the Japanese are onto something. So is Donald Trump when they go like this. Okay? Hand to hand is the number one way of prevention, of, of catching a, a, an infection. Okay? So hand washing, if you can't wash your hands, Purell, carry a little something around with you. Other things, flu shot, pneumonia vaccine. That's prevention. That's 90% right there. What's the other 10%? Anyone know? The other 10% is everything else. Or anything else, okay? And we talked about the fact that anything else can really be everything else because if you have the right doctor, take your medications properly, exercise, eat right, manage your stress and prevent your infection, but somebody steps on your foot on the bus and now you can't walk, then everything you did doesn't help you walk, okay? So there's a lot of things in addition to everything I said that can come into play that can help you become less active and can make you more short of breath. However, those are the big ones, okay? That's my definition of ultimate pulmonary wellness. And we will get to those individually, if not tonight, over the course of the lecture series. Any questions or comments so far? There's also one thing too a hundred percent. So Dorothy, who is uh, really miserable usually, but tonight she's extremely happy, um, she said the right attitude. And you know what? That's a hundred percent correct, okay? You know that you can see people who are 20 years old, okay, who are walking around you say, how do you feel? And they go, oh, I feel terrible. I'm so tired. This sucks. Why do I have to come to this lecture? You know, things like that, okay? And then there's people who can be 90 years old or 100 years old that they come in and they go, hey, how you doing today? Nice to see you, okay? Your attitude plays a gigantic role, okay? You know that there are some people that wherever they go, they have a problem, right? There are some people, I'm one of them, okay? There are some people who wherever they go, they have a good time, okay? Now, if wherever you go, you have a good time, then you're a good time. If wherever you go, you have a problem, guess what? You're the problem, okay? <laughs> so sometimes adjusting your mental attitude can play a big role uh, in terms of how you feel. You know, I remember one very odd incident that happened to me about 15 years ago. I was working at NYU Medical Center, and it was the end of the day, and I got into the elevator, and somebody said to me, how are you doing? And I said, ah, tired. And I stood there for a second, I said, why did I just say that? I said, I'm not really tired. I said, but I said that. That has become a part of my routine to say, I'm tired. And I'm not tired. Why should I be tired? I haven't worked eight hours. That's like a half day for me now. So the thing is that sometimes adjusting your mindset is a big part of how you can. And I look around this table, and you guys wouldn't be here if you didn't have a good attitude. Okay? I know all of you personally. You I just met, but I've emailed with you. You I, 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 I've seen only a couple times. But I know that everybody here has a good attitude or you wouldn't be here. And everybody here has at least something that is, uh, what I say, in addition to a good attitude, it's part of a good attitude, but one word that comes to mind is hope. And when I gave President Obama that word for his campaign <laughs> years ago, I said to him, I said, President Obama, there's one word that I want you to use. Hope. And you know, he took my advice, and here we are five years later, okay? But the other thing is optimism. And there is research over and over and over again that shows that people with optimistic personalities 
do well, okay? I've had patients who have come here who have come to me from ex extreme circumstances, people who have survived concentration camps, people who have survived um, you know, medical malfunction or things like that, but they come here with hope. And they come here with the idea that they want things to be better, okay? With that in mind, okay, things can always be better, but also keep in mind that things can always be worse. So there's a statement that I heard recently that I think is a really great statement. Um, and some people say, well, you know, I'm 80 years old, I've already lived my life, I'm 90 years old, I've already lived my life, I'm 100 years old, I've already lived my life. I look at people here, and I know, I, I'll say it again, and I look around, I say the same thing that I said last time. I know there's some people here in their 50s through 70s, I know there's a lot of people here in their 80s, and I know there's more than a handful of people here that are in their 90s, okay? There's no one here over 100, unless you lie on your application. Okay? But that being said, if I say to you, how old do you feel? No one here is going to tell me, I feel 90. Okay? Most people are going to say, I can't believe it. When I look in the mirror, I have no idea who that is looking back at me. Because a lot of times, if you saw the transcripts of our conversations, or you heard the laughter, or you heard the voices, you would never think, that this person was 90 years old, or that this person was 80 years old, that this person is 70 years old. I don't know if it's a New York thing, but my patients are, uh, you know, as contemporary and in many ways more contemporary than people my own age, which is why I've opened up my dating circle to 95 and below. So, so that, keep that in mind. Sasha will give you my number at the end of the. At the end of the all right, so other things, <coughs> ultimate pulmonary wellness. So again, you don't have to memorize this, okay? But if you have questions about it, I'm more than happy to answer them. And I'm gonna review a few other things from last week. In order for you to really take care of yourself the most effectively, okay, you have to have a good understanding of why, what am I even doing, okay? Why, why am I here? The majority of people are here because they have some type of pulmonary disease, okay? And until most people got short of breath, maybe you knew what pulmonary meant, maybe, maybe you didn't know what pulmonary meant, okay? But to be clear, when we talk about the pulmonary system, we are talking about the respiratory system, okay? And basically what we're talking about, another word for it is the ventilatory system, okay? And the, the pulmonary system really has one major function in the body but it's a big function, okay? So what's the purpose of our respiratory system? To carry oxygen, okay? So to deliver fuel to the body, right? So oxygen is our number one fuel of, re of respiration. What else? So if it brings fuel, it's gotta remove waste products, right? So the main function of the respiratory system is really bringing oxygen to the body and removing the waste products of the body. So every single thing that we do, whether it's get up and walk to the bathroom, come out, there are waste products. There are waste products of all our activity that are built up in the bloodstream. The number one waste product that we talk about when it, when it talks about the respiratory system is really carbon dioxide, right? And we talked about how this chemistry of oxygen delivery and carbon dioxide removal is really the impetus behind breathing, okay? The body uh, has an autonomic nervous system, right? You've heard about this? So there's a voluntary nervous system and an autonomic nervous system. So the voluntary nervous system means that I want to get a drink, I have to walk over here and pick up this cup and take a drink. I can't will it. I can't say drink and wait for that drink to come to me. And likewise, it doesn't happen automatically, okay? But I don't have to think about breathing in the same way. Because if we did, we would die when we sleep, okay? So the body has certain mechanisms that come into play so that we don't have to say, oh, time to breathe, oh, time to breathe. And the majority of these signals are chemical signals, okay? So the body has certain receptors, and when we talk about chemistry, we're talking about chemoreceptors. And those chemoreceptors are located in three places. Number one, 
They're located in the aorta, okay, which comes off the heart. They're located in the carotid arteries, which are right over here. And they're located in a part of the brain stem called the medulla, which is really the respiratory center, okay? And we talked about this last week. A lot of people think we breathe when we don't have enough oxygen. But that's really a secondary system. We really breathe when we have too much carbon dioxide. Okay, so your carbon dioxide builds up and it goes to the medulla and the medulla sends a signal, right? And this is all chemical and neurologic and that stimulates breathing. So we talked about a couple of different things. So we talked about how, it, how does this go? So you know that you need part of the neurologic system for this, right? So if the medulla wants to make you breathe, there's a certain nerve that it's going to use to stimulate respiration, okay? Does anyone remember what the nerve is? What's that? It's not the vagus, it's not the vagus nerve, but it is the phrenic nerve, that's correct, okay? So think about it like this. The phrenic nerve is a nerve, okay? Does everyone know how the nervous system works? So you know that you have, let's say, the spine, and there are certain nerves that come out, and you have this vertebral body, and they come out of different levels of the spine. So the nerve that we're talking about is the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve is associated with the cervical spine, which is the neck, right? So the spine is broken up into the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, and the sacrum and the coccyx, okay? But the, the cervical nerves really take care of breathing and your upper body. So cervical nerve three, four, and five innervate the diaphragm. So what did we talk about last week? We talked about the fact then that if you have neck problems, those can then, that's an orthopedic problem that can then impinge upon the nervous system that can then impinge upon your respiratory system, okay? The other thing to keep in mind is that sometimes there can be problems with the phrenic nerve. And somebody here mentioned that they had heart surgery and after the heart surgery, they have had a phrenic nerve paralysis or um, a, what we call a, diaphragm, a paralyzed diaphragm. And we talked about the fact that sometimes during heart surgery, the ice that they use to cool down the heart, okay, they want the heart to be generally at a low metabolism during heart surgery, so they use ice to cool it down. And sometimes that can have an impact on the phrenic nerve where the diaphragm doesn't contract properly afterwards, okay? So then the other thing is we talked about the muscles of respiration. Respiration consists of two cycles inspiration and expiration. Inhale, exhale, right? So let's just talk for a little bit about the components of the respiratory system. And I just wanna talk for a second before, before I do that. Carbon dioxide and oxygen, that mix is called gas exchange, okay? So ultimately, if we'd say, what is the main purpose of the respiratory system? The main purpose is gas exchange. And anyone know where that occurs? study in the alveoli and we'll get to that. So let's talk about how air gets from out here to the alveoli, okay? So let's start with the fact that um, we have some carbon dioxide building up and we need to take a breath. So the medulla senses that, um, you know, we, we have some high carbon dioxide, we need to stimulate respiration. So how does air enter the body? Air can enter in one of two places. Okay? Normally. Abnormally, it can enter in many places. Okay? But under normal conditions, air is going to enter through the nose and the mouth. Right? So there's benefits. To, I learned something new today, which is that horses can only breathe through their nose, which explains why their nostrils are so big and they point outward. Very interesting fact for, for me. I don't know if it is for you. But here's the thing. So air can enter through the nose and it can enter through the mouth. So, there are benefits to the air entering through the nose. There are three major purposes that breathing in through your nose serves. And as you know, when we teach better breathing techniques, we are teaching you basically to breathe through your nose. So, anyone know the three functions? So, it warms the air. It warms the air because you have capillaries in the nose that are fresh blood that are warming the air. What else? It filters the air. You have little hairs called cilia that trap particles. What else does it do? One more. Okay, so 
So it, it warms, it filters, and it humidifies, okay? So think of it like this. The body wants to use air that is most like its internal environment. You ever heard the term homeostasis? So homeostasis is the process by all the body systems, okay, try to maintain normalcy. So for example, temperature, 98.7, right? Or is it 98.6? It is 98.6. So, um, you know, we like to maintain 98.6. So if we're cold, if we're in a room where it's only 60 degrees, we can shiver to, to build up some body heat, okay? So the body likes things that are similar to how it is on the inside. So when it comes to air, it wants it to be warm, it wants it to be clean, and it wants it to be humidified. And that means that the body has to have less adaptations as we move along. It can also come in through the mouth, okay? There is a benefit to breathing in through your mouth under certain circumstances, and that benefit, anyone know? What's that? If your nose is obstructed. Well, if your nose is obstructed, you don't have a choice. That's true, okay? But the other thing is that you have the benefit of it being able to take in a larger volume of air sometimes, okay? So, for example, runners, uh, you know, when they're at a regular pace, they may breathe in through their nose and out through their mouth, but as they start sprinting and going faster and requiring a greater delivery of air, they may have to breathe in through their mouth. So sometimes when somebody's working at a very high rate and they say, I can't breathe in enough through my nose, or they say my nose is stuck, then we will try, we will allow you to breathe in through your mouth as well, but also blow out through first lips. Question. How does your nose humidify? The same thing, the capillaries. So the capillaries are able to warm and humidify. So, other questions so far? What when the nose is stuck? If the nose is stuck, that's a great question because it happens a lot, okay? Um, you have to breathe in through your mouth. Yeah. You have no choice. So if your nose is stuffed up, you have to breathe in through your mouth. But it's much less comfortable, right? So here's another thing. A lot of people complain of sort of sinus issues this yeah. time of year, okay? Um, the, the air, especially if you live in an older building, the air that comes out of the heat is very, very dry, okay? And the time that we move, we lose most of our, our, our water content, anyone know? When you're asleep, okay? Most people sleep with their mouth open, okay? And we're blowing off a lot of water. That's why you can go to sleep weighing three pounds more than when you wake up in the morning. It's not, you, you say, I didn't go to the bathroom, I didn't go anywhere unless I slept walk or something like that, but you blow off a lot of water vapor, okay? So at this time of the year, I always recommend that people use a humidifier at night, okay? And there are humidifiers that are better, that, you know, better at warding off bacteria. I know that's a concern for a lot of people. They worry that, you know, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get something from this humidifier, but think about, do I wanna walk around all day with clear nasal passages and feeling moist or do I want to spend a little time each day, you know, with that? The other thing, uh, nasal rinses, okay? Things like, there's, there are saline solutions, yeah, things yeah, like salt air or neti pots, very, very effective, okay? People never, they say, oh, what is this going to do to me? But believe me, if you get in the habit of using it, there's a lot of dust, especially, we live in New York City, there's a lot of dust here, okay? I didn't realize how much dust there was in New York City until I started wearing contact lenses. And I don't wear contact lenses because if I wear them here, by 10 a.m. my eyes are killing me, okay? I could go to the Caribbean to scuba dive, I could wear a pair of daily disposable contacts for seven days and not even realize that they're on because the air is so much clearer, okay? I have people who go to Vermont and come back and say, boy, I felt so great out there, uh, I was able to breathe. It's New York City, so these nasal rinses are a big help, especially in the winter time. Question. Yeah. What's that? X clear. X clear? I don't know what that is. What is it? It's a nasal rinse? Oh. It's a nasal rinse? It's made with xylitol. What's that? It's made with xylitol, which is a, a, a natural uh, antiseptic. Decongestant? Okay. So no, an antiseptic. Antiseptic. Okay. The only thing I'll say about that, I, I, you heard me say, I don't know what it is, okay? But I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say this, okay? Saline is very similar to what's in the body, okay? Sometimes and often, people with respiratory diseases or people who have difficulty breathing, any type of chemical can actually do more harm than it's good. It's a natural sugar. It's a natural sugar. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say this. I would have to look it up and get back to you with that. But sometimes people use things like afrin or neosinephrine or things like that. 
and over the long term they can actually do more harm than good. I try to keep it as natural as possible, and so you know the, the other uh, you know humidifier at night, um, nasal rinse. The other big component of that: drink plenty of water. Okay, being dehydrated has tremendously negative effects on the respiratory system, and we'll talk about some of them. Question: the question Air. Is something air. Like air is great. Okay. Now, what do you do? So you don't get this infected. I'm always concerned about this. You stick it in your nose, you blow it, and there's all sorts of germs on it, and you keep on using it week after week. So it's like dry. Yeah, I mean, first of all, the simple answer is, is wipe it off. Yeah. And if you want to wipe it off with like you know an you know like one of those wipes, but the odds of you infecting yourself yeah. are not that great. Okay. Now, if you gave it to someone else here to use, the odds of infecting them are great. You know what I mean? It, it's like, you know, like we like our own problems. It's like, you know, this guy's my brother. He's, you know, he is what he is, but he's family. It's like we like our own germs, okay? So we build up a certain array of germs that are, you know, that's in our body. Okay? Everybody has bacteria, and it's all over us, and some of it is protective to us, okay? But I'm not going to get myself sick. You don't have to stay away from yourself when you're sick because you don't want to get yourself sick again, okay? Although sometimes you'd like to. But it's more dangerous to everybody else than to you. What about nasal gas? I was in the bus today and I gave a gum to a guy and he opens and he pushes me out with a thing. So I didn't use the gum, I gave him away to the He put what in his mouth? The gum with the paper gum. She's afraid that she no, gave, she handed him the package that there's germs on the package here. Yeah. You know what, here's the thing, if you don't know, okay, we are our public transportation takers, okay, so in the same way that once this lecture is over, my next group, uh, you know, they don't know who sat in these seats, and I'm not going to tell them, no, I'm just kidding, um, but, but the thing is, we don't know who sat in the seat before us, okay, and we don't know if that person had the flu. I went to a meeting today on the third floor of this building, and the guy sits down and he goes, oh, this flu is killing me. I went, meeting's <laughs> over, see you later. <laughs> because I don't want to be around someone who's sick, you know, not because, I'm, believe me, I'm not discriminatory, I'm not a sickest, okay, um, but I have to protect myself just like you have to protect yourself, okay? Flu shot, pneumonia vaccine, but you don't know who was sitting there before you. So that's why hand washing, you know, have you ever gotten to a cab and you feel something wet? Yeah. And you say, boy, I wonder what that is. <laughs> um, you don't know what it is. So the way is, you have to protect yourself, okay? And what I would do is have Purell with you at all times, okay? Or, you know, because sometimes you can't wash your hands, but at least you know whatever was just in that taxi, you just killed it. Question. What about nasal gels? What about them? What, how do they function? What's their purpose? I think uh, it depends on the gel. You know, in the same way, there's, there's different gels for different things, okay? So I, I think we'd have to talk about specifics. But again, um, if you're unsure, I mean, ask your doctor if they think it would be beneficial for you. Anything you want to start, aside from, you know, air or saline, those things are harmless. Well, they don't necessarily trap bacteria if you think of water-based gel. Not necessarily. Okay. One question about humidifiers, cold versus hot. Cool water is better. Last question, then we're going to move on. What's the difference between a humidifier and an air purifier? Okay, so it sounds obvious, but an air humidifier, okay, is going to add moisture to the air. So, in other words, think of it like this. Um, air can be thicker or thinner, right? So when you watch the television and they say the barometer is high, or they say the humidity is high, or the barometric pressure is high, or the hum it's 80% humidity, that means that the air is able to hold a certain amount of water before it has to rain, okay? So it's the same type of thing. So in other words, if you say this is a dry room, that means that it's probably not holding as much water in the air as it could. So a humidifier is going to vaporize water so that it joins the air, making what you breathe in and out more moist. Okay? And a, a purifier, okay, something similar to this, is something that has filters in it, okay? And the newer ones and the better ones also have what we call a UV sterilizer, ultraviolet sterilizer, which is a great way to really kill bacteria. And what those do is they filter, okay? So any, like, let's say if this room were smoky, and that would take the smoke in, run it through a filter, and put out cleaner air. 
So same thing, like if, it, if a bacteria were to come into it, hopefully the UV sterilizer would, would kill that bacteria, okay? And both are very good, I recommend both. We have them all over the place. I use a, a UV sterilizer in all of my fish tanks, and it sounds funny, but since I do, the fish don't get sick as much, okay? So let's go back to the respiratory system. So air can enter through the nose and the mouth, okay? You know what another name for the throat is? There's another name for the throat. It's called the pharynx, okay? So you've heard the word pharyngitis before. We know that itis means inflammation, right? So pharyngitis is a sore throat or inflammation of the throat. And the throat really can be thought of in three ways. So you have the, where it enters in the nose, the nasopharynx, okay? Where it enters in the mouth, the oral or oral pharynx. And then when it gets down to the voice box, okay? Anyone know a name for the voice box? Larynx. Larynx, okay? So you know laryngitis, that's inflammation of the voice box, okay? So, and all these join to the pharynx, okay? And this is the first process where the air goes. So it enters through the nose or the mouth, passes the nasal pharynx, the laryngopharynx, and then down to the pharynx, where we just call it the pharynx, okay? And then it's going to join the first. Now, what we've talked about so far is basically the upper respiratory system. So you've heard of res upper respiratory infection. Most people don't know what that means, but it means basically the nose, the sinuses, the very beginning of the throat, okay? Then we go into the middle layers. And the middle layers are basically the laryngopharynx, okay, the trachea. What's the trachea? The windpipe. The windpipe, okay? And the trachea is very important because it's the first place that air is going to go through in the airways. The trachea, everyone just feel over here, somewhere around here, there's like a little ridge in your chest, okay? That's the point at which the trachea splits into right and left main stem bronchus, okay? You've heard bronchitis, inflammation of the bronchi. One of them is called a bronchus, more than one is called bronchi, okay? So the trachea comes down, it splits into right and left main stem bronchi, and then it continues to branch anywhere from 20 to 23 times, de delivering air to the different lobes and segments of the lung, and ultimately to the alveolar, where gas exchange occurs, okay? Any questions about that so far? So the other reason why the trachea is very important, okay, is because how many people here have, have a cough? So a lot of people with pulmonary disease produce a lot of mucus, okay? Okay, a lot of people do. And the thing is that what people don't realize is that the cough mechanism is truly only effective from that ridge up. It's really only effective from the main stem bronchi, or a little bit lower than that ridge, but from the main stem bronchi up. So a lot of times, your doctor will say something to you like, oh, I hear some mucus in the left lower lobe, right? So the left lower lobe is down here, and I just told you that the cough mechanism is only effective from here up. So what does that mean? That means that you can cough till the cows come home, and that mucus is just gonna rattle around inside your chest, and you're not gonna be able to clear it unless you get it to here. And that's where things like chest physical therapy and acapella valve come into play, so that it can help you bring it up so that you can cough it out, okay? Any questions so far? All right, so let's talk about the respiratory muscles, okay? What is the main muscle of respiration? Or let's say we talked about two components. Excuse me, I just wanna get my clock so that I can have an idea of time. I'm okay. <laughs> okay, so we talked about um, inspiration and expiration, right? So inspiration really has one main muscle. What is it? The diaphragm. The, the diaphragm. And we talked about the fact that the diaphragm is innervated by C3 and 5, which innervates the phrenic nerve. So the body, the medulla, sends out a signal to breathe, and what happens is the phrenic nerve fires, okay, and the diaphragm contracts downward. Okay? So the diaphragm is normally a dome-shaped muscle. So if you look at this sheet right here, this is the diaphragm. And the diaphragm sits underneath the lungs, and when that stimulates to contract, it contracts downward, and that creates a negative pressure, and that negative pressure is what fills up the lungs. Okay? 
Now there are a couple of other muscles that you can use. Okay, one of them in particular is, the, is called the external intercostals. Okay, the intercostals. Inter means in between. Costal means ribs. Okay, so the intercostals are in between the ribs. But under normal circumstances, the diaphragm is the main muscle that you want to be using. Now the problem is when people have pulmonary disease, the diaphragm does not always function effectively, particularly things like COPD, emphysema, where the lungs become very large and they press down on the diaphragm. So the diaphragm no longer has this nice dome shape, the diaphragm becomes flattened and that doesn't allow you to take a nice deep breath, okay? What about exhalation? Okay, now what, wait, before we go into exhalation, inspiration, there's also other things called accessory muscles of inspiration. Okay? So even though it's really only supposed to be the diaphragm and the external intercostals, <coughs> if you're having difficulty breathing, then your body has a lot of things that it can do to help breathe. So these accessory muscles, muscles of the neck, muscles of the chest, muscles of the back, can all help to elevate the rib cage in a jam. It's not the ideal, but in a last ditch effort, it's better than nothing. Okay? But you probably notice that while you're on the treadmill, we're trying to get you to do diaphragmatic breathing, okay? You probably notice that when you're struggling, your shoulders come all the way up. And sometimes, if you notice, there are some people with rest, I, I know who has lung disease just by looking at them. And one giveaway is when you look at people's necks. Because very often, people who have very developed muscles on their necks, that comes from overuse because the diaphragm is not doing its, its job as effectively as it could. So you have to use these accessory muscles of respiration, of inspiration, really. So that's why when you're walking on the treadmill and you're going, we say, relax, bring your shoulders down. We want to teach you to use your diaphragm because it's not something that we think about, okay? Particularly in today's society, women more than men are particularly bad at using their diaphragm. Why? Because as you grew up, you were taught to keep your stomach tight, right? Men don't care. Men don't drink a bug and let it all hang out. They're good diaphragmatic breathers, okay? At least better than women, okay? Babies are good diaphragmatic breathers. You want to see a baby breathe? You want to see a good breather? Look at a baby. They're belly breathing, okay? That's the way it's naturally supposed to be. But can you believe that society regulates how you breathe? And whether or not you use your diaphragm? And I'm not talking about pro-choice. Okay. Thank you, Judy. I, I'll be here all night. Um, so other things. Um, you have to learn to use your diaphragm again. As I mentioned, the diaphragm is usually controlled by the autonomic nervous system, so we don't have to think of it. But the thing is that when you start a pulmonary program or when you're short of breath, part of what we need to do is we need to backtrack a little bit. We need to reteach you about how to use that so that you can become very aware of it, so that you can then do the activities that cause you shortness of breath. Okay, question? When I have shortness of breath, particularly walking outside, my natural inclination is to relax my shoulders, as you mentioned. I've studied pranayama yoga breathing. I'm sorry? I've studied pranayama yoga breathing. Pranayama breathing, okay. So I there you learn that, of course, when you do that, you're, you're making the lung space smaller, the air space smaller. Right. So, am I right in trying to this first lower my lower Well, here's the thing. Pranayama breathing is a little bit different. So, if I'm not mistaken, what you're talking about is this, right? So, you're going to go, and then, that's pranayama breathing, right? Okay. So, pranayama breathing, okay, is designed in a different way, okay? It's not necessarily designed to incorporate the diaphragm as best way as possible, okay? It's a different goal, and it's not generally... Um, with the idea in mind that the person's got a diaphragmatic issue, okay? Um, I, I will have a few other ways that I would encourage you to breathe on the street, and that's what the purpose of tonight's lecture is, so we're definitely going to get to that. So I'm going to teach you how to breathe, and I'm also going to teach you things about recovery from shortness of breath, okay? Because I think that's one of the things that people get really scared of, is that they're afraid that if I walk another half a block, I don't know if I'm going to make it back. Okay? And that's a problem. And again, that that is something that prevents people from doing the behaviors that they need to be doing. Does this all apply to people who are asthmatic as well? hundred yeah. percent. Asthma is right up there in obstructive pulmonary disease. So, so no, don't touch your shoulders or, or don't 
No, don't punch your shark. I'm, I'm not going to say that. It's like this. If you have, uh, if you're in the middle of the sea and there's a shark circling you and you are having trouble swimming and someone throws you a life raft, a lifeline, I'm not saying don't take the lifeline, but I'm saying in the future if you learned how to swim, that would be better. Okay? So I'd say that when you're short of breath, here's the thing, another thing. Preparation is 90% of the game, okay? So what I hope to give you tonight is some tools that are going to help you be prepared so that you don't get to that point. Okay, and believe it or not, they're out there. Okay, and they're they're here in the room tonight, and I'm gonna introduce you to them. Okay? That's great, but that's different. That's an acapella device and that is for secretion clearance. So that's a little bit different. The nebulizer. Okay, and that's all part of it. Okay? It's that anything you could do. Here's the thing. I said this last week. If you're going off to battle, okay, I want to give you a helmet. I want to give you a chest shield. I want to give you some armor for your legs. I want to give you some guns. I don't want to send you out to battle in like your sweatpants and a t-shirt. So I, my goal is to teach you as many different things as possible. If you want to go to a restaurant where they, they only have made one dish, where it's like no no Coke, Pepsi, or cheeseburger, <laughs> you can get a cheeseburger, 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 chips, and that's all they have. No, you want to go to a cook who has a lot of tools in their tool belt. And that's what I want to give you is as many tools as possible. So let's continue on, okay? We talk about shortness of breath. So one of the things that people probably notice is that when you get short of breath, initially, remember the first time you were short of breath? It probably happened when you were doing something at a high level of exertion. And the three things that I hear most in New York City are walking up the subway stairs, walking uphill, and running for the bus. Okay? So how many people have heard this? You know what? I used to take the subway everywhere, but I can't do the stairs, so I don't go out as much. Okay? Or how many people can map out the city by the hills or where they have to sit down, right? <laughs> or how many people have had this experience? I saw the bus and I thought about running for it and then I said, I'll wait for the next bus, right? So here's the thing. For every activity that you do that's high level, you need a lot of muscle for it, okay? So if all of a sudden you used to take the subway twice a day and now you're not taking the subway at all, guess what? All those muscles that you use to walk up and down the subway stairs get weaker, okay? When a muscle becomes weaker, when a muscle becomes deconditioned, it does not use oxygen as efficiently, okay? And as a result, now what happens? Now you get short of breath at lower levels of activity. So now maybe it's walking on flat surfaces I get short of breath, or walking more than two blocks. And my store where I used to do shopping is two blocks away, but I can only walk one block now. So I call Gristides for a delivery, right? So now all the muscle you used to, used to walk two blocks to the store get weaker, they don't use oxygen as well, and you decondition again. So what are the solutions people get to that when they ask for help? They get medicine, right? They get inhalers, they get nebulizers, they get many different things, and I'm not saying that's wrong, okay? But here's something that may blow your mind, but if you weren't, if you were here last time, it may not blow your mind, or you may have forgotten, and it may blow your mind all over again. When you look at pulmonary function tests, right? So when you go to your doctor and you do this, and the person goes, breathe, 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 breathe. Yeah. So what does that tell us? That gives us a general measure of the state of your lungs, right? So that's the, not the state of the union, that's the state of your lungs. So a lot of times, people come for rehab, and if you read the classic literature about pulmonary rehab, I can show you hundreds of articles, if not thousands of articles, that say when people go through a rehab program, they feel better, they can do more, and then we retested them on pulmonary function, and their pulmonary function did not improve at all. How is that possible? Okay? What does that tell you? Okay? Or here's the, the converse of that. Okay? You just got over a cold, okay? You feel run down, you're exhausted all day, you feel more short of breath, you go to your doctor, they do a pulmonary function test, and guess what? It hasn't gotten worse. How is that possible, okay? There's only one thing that that can be. What that is telling you is that there are many other factors involved in shortness of breath other than just your lung function, okay? Now here's the other thing, okay? Most pulmonary rehab programs that you go to will exercise you 
on the machines at a very low level for a long period of time, okay? Now here's the thing, if your life requires level eight to do everything you want to do, and I exercise you at level two, you could do level two till the cows come home, but you're never going to get better at living your life, okay? And the problem is that most people, including the medical profession, are afraid of home medications. They're afraid to push you because just like you're afraid that something's going to happen, they're afraid that something's going to happen, okay? But the simple fact of the matter is that we have dozens, if not hundreds of cases of improved pulmonary function. And the major difference between our program and every other program in the world that I know of, with the exception of Tel Aviv University, is that we exercise people at very high levels. So if your life requires level eight, I want to exercise you at level 10. Right, Marguerite? <laughs> so people walk in here and they see my 90-year-old patients walking up a hill that looks like a cross between Kilimanjaro and Machu Picchu and they say, what the hell is going on in this place? They think we're making some kind of movie or something, okay? But the truth of the matter is, that's how you get better. And believe it or not, that vigorous exercise actually is going to make you, hey, how are you doing? Come on in, Donna. So, uh, seats, can we get another seat, Sasha, please? So the other, the other thing is that that exercise twice or three times a week actually decreases your chance of having an adverse cardiac event, okay? That's the truth. Now, talk about shortness of breath again. What do we do about it, okay? So if deconditioning plays a giant role in getting you shorter breath, then conditioning obviously plays, you, plays a big role in getting you out of that shortness of breath situation. Now, there's something that I want to show you. There's a little chart in here, okay? And there's a, a real importance to that. Now, I'm not looking to make scientists out of you, okay? But this is the best... But this is... No, it's in there. It's in there. It's in yours. Oh. Okay. So let me explain to you something very important and why. This is going to be the... This is a very important point, so if you weren't listening yet, now is the time to start, okay? So this point is why we do these different breathing techniques, okay? Remember where I told you gas exchange occurs? Where? Alveoli. Alveoli, right? So that's deep and it's small. So let me let you in on a little secret, okay? All of the air that you breathe in and out does not get into the alveoli. Okay? So that's important to know because only the air that gets to the alveoli is able to be used by your body. Where is the alveoli? The alveoli, so if you look here, okay, air enters through the nose and the mouth, it goes down the trachea, which is the windpipe. The trachea splits into the bronchi. The bronchi is split into smaller branches called bronchioles, and then they lead to the alveoli. And the alveoli are the air sacs. Okay? The air sacs where gas exchange occurs. So in other words, carbon dioxide leaves the body or, or goes out of the body and, and oxygen gets into the blood. Okay? So carbon dioxide leaves the blood and oxygen goes into the blood. So here's the thing, okay? How you breathe has a gigantic role in how much gets into the alveoli. Now, again, don't memorize this chart, okay? But let me tell you what it means, okay? The average person breathes, how many liters of air do you think you breathe in a minute? One. One liter per minute? How many people say? Okay, six liters. I, I, I figured out your secret, which is that you're reading the handout. You didn't really study it. You cheated. Okay, so here's the thing. Six liters of air per minute on average, right? Six liters of air is 6,000 milliliters. Okay? Now here's why that's important. Okay? The average respiratory rate or the normal respiratory rate at rest is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. So let me tell you what that means. We have something called a tidal volume. The top, and again, this is science. Okay? So I, I want you to understand the concept without getting too scientific. But the tidal volume is how much air do you breathe in and out with each breath. Okay? The respiratory rate 
is how many breaths do you take per minute? So if we multiply how many breaths do you take per minute by how much do you breathe in with each air? So it's like this, how many cups can I breathe per minute? How much is in each cup? Very simple, okay? So the idea is that basically um, how you breathe is gonna play a big role in this. So if we say 6,000 milliliters in a minute, right? And we breathe at 12 breaths per minute, which is normal, and you divide that into 6,000. That means that each breath contains 500 milliliters of air. So here's something else, and I know this is a little too, a little scientific, but it's, I'll go back and, and make you understand it. The trachea holds about as many milliliters of air as you weigh in pounds. So let's just use a 150 pound person as an example. That means 150 milliliters of air are used up by the trachea, meaning they can't get to the blood. So at 12 breaths per minute, if you take in 500 milliliters per breath, remove that 150 milliliters called dead space, and that means only 350 milliliters of air are getting to where your body can use it, okay? And that's assuming that all the rest is gonna make it there. Raise the respiratory rate to 20, okay? And that means that only 300 milliliters of air per breath will make up that 6,000 milliliters. Question? Why don't you get more when you breathe more? That doesn't make sense to me. Because the more you breathe, okay, first of all, airway mechanics, so very often it's hard to, it's like this, okay? We have all these people here, right? If I say, make a single line, let's go on the elevator, I can get in, and you can get in, and you can get in, if I go, everybody quick, get in the elevator, we go like this. You, we're all gonna jam up. Same thing with the air, okay? So there's only so much air you can use at a certain period of time. So the harder you work, the more airway narrowing you get. And think about it like this. There's only so much time in a minute, right? So if you're gonna make 20 trips, it's like you, your, your parents or your kids want, you wanna unload the car, let's put it like this, whatever you're doing, it, okay? You wanna make a lot of trips, so you wanna carry a lot with each trip. So the more trips, you know, the heavier you get, the more air you move, the less trips you're gonna to have to take, because it's it's it takes a longer time, okay, to get it in and out. So it's not like you're able to take the same amount of, of air with each breath you take. So if you were to breathe 60 breaths per minute, that's only one second per breath. So how could you possibly move the same amount of air? Right? Does that make sense? Is that clear? It's not longer. It takes longer. So now here's the, the other big thing, okay? 40 breaths per minute. Now 40 breaths per minute is fast, okay? But sometimes people come in here and they're like, <sighs> they're breathing 40 breaths per minute. And at 40 breaths per minute, at 6,000 milliliters, that means 150 milliliters per breath. That means it's all used here. So that means when you're, when you're panting, when you're short of breath, when you're going, all that air is going in and out, in and out, in and out, and none of it's getting into your lungs. So we talk about oxygen saturation, right? So none of that air is getting to the, to the blood, and that means oxygen saturation is sinking. The concentration of oxygen is going down in your blood, the concentration of carbon dioxide is going up. Yes, sir? This is only slightly tangential. I bet that's an important principle in the of that. Very important principle in scuba diving, okay? Except in scuba diving it's a little different because in scuba diving you get a tank and that tank is gonna give you something every time you breathe. So we're out of time, we're not out of time, but I have a great scuba story where it was the only time I actually thought I was gonna die in my life and it's not related to me, it's related to somebody else that I took diving that was supposed to have 45 to an hour worth of air and he was out of air in 12 minutes. Because when you have a scuba tank, every time you take a breath, that discharge. So if you go, you're loose, that's coming out of the tank, but it's not getting to, to your body. So in scuba diving, the idea is slow, deep breaths. So the, the funny thing is, people don't believe this, but scuba diving and pulmonary rehab are so similar. It's, it's the, the parallels are so incredible in terms, I teach scuba, I'm also a professional rescue diver, okay? So one of the things about scuba is that when people have a problem, it's almost always anxiety based. And it's because they go, they use all the air and then they panic. Now when people here have a problem, it's often anxiety based, so they go, okay? The effect of anxiety or the effect of shortness of breath on anxiety is it raises it. The effect of anxiety on shortness of breath is it raises it. Okay? So the idea is to break into that cycle by giving you tools that you can use. Okay? 
So now, just very quickly, pulmonary disease, okay? Pulmonary disease can fall into two main categories, okay? Obstructive pulmonary disease and restricted pulmonary disease. And they're almost opposite, okay? But the thing about them being opposite is that their number one symptom is exactly the same, shortness of breath, okay? That's the commonality between pretty much every person that comes here, that they're all short of breath at some point or another. Now, obstructive pulmonary diseases. Anyone know any? COPD. COPD. So COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. When we talk about COPD, we're talking about two main diseases, okay? We're talking about chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So the distinction between the two is that chronic bronchitis is disease of the large airways or the bronchi, and emphysema is disease of the small airways and the alveoli, okay? The number one culprit in both, cigarette smoking, okay? The treatment for both is about the same. So whereas 20 years ago, uh, when they taught about it, uh, you know, they taught us about blue bloaters who are the chronic bronchitic patient and pink puffers who are the emphysema patient and they showed your picture and one looked like this and one looked like this. We know that most people have a combination of both because unlike Bill Clinton, most people do it in okay? <laughs> so, other things, okay? What are some other obstructive pulmonary diseases? Asthma, not fibrosis. Fibrosis is restrictive, okay? What else obstructive? Asthma. Asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, okay? Um, so here's the thing about obstructive pulmonary diseases. In obstructive pulmonary diseases, people have a difficulty exhaling, okay? That sounds strange, but people have trouble blowing air out, okay? So like an elevator, if it doesn't go up, it's hard for it to go down. And if it doesn't go down, it's hard for it to go up. It's the same thing with your lungs. It doesn't matter if you have a problem with inspiration or a problem with expiration. If you have a problem with one, you probably have a problem with the other because they're cyclical. It's like yin and yang, and they only work when they work together, okay? Now, in restrictive disease, the problem is the opposite. The problem is that people have a hard time breathing air in. And so the person with obstructive disease is generally going to wind up with a bigger lung, but that lung is filled with quite a bit of dead space. So it's not like you have a great big lung that's a supercharged lung, it's that you're stuck out here. So one way to think about it is if, let's see, could I have a can of soda please? No, could I have a grape? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's say like this. So let's say if this is how the normal lung is supposed to be, okay? This is supposed to be able to do this. So let's, let's put these even closer together. So this is supposed to be able to do this. And that's normal, okay? When you have an obst a, a, a obstructive disease, that lung gets bigger. Okay, so you see how there's more air in there, but guess what? You can't exhale it, so you can only do, so you can only do this. So a lesser volume of air is able to be moved, but it's moving at the larger lung volume. So in other words, we're really full, and we come to not so full. We're really full, we come to not so full. Okay, a good lung, okay, is supposed to be able to fill completely and not empty completely. There's always going to be a little bit of residual volume in there, but pretty much empty a lot, okay? Now in this lung, we have the opposite problem. So we can't fill. So that's going to be a smaller chest and a smaller lung. So you're going to be able to breathe in and out, in and out. And the thing is that in pulmonary uh, obstructive disease, you wind up with kind of a floppier lung. So imagine if instead of a balloon, you had like one of those plastic bags from a store. It's hard to deflate, okay? And in a restrictive disease, it's like you have a hot water bottle and you're trying to you know, inflate that, but it's tough to, to take that breath in. Okay, they can, uh, someone with obstructive disease and someone with restrictive disease can have the same exact amount of air moving, a lower volume of air in both, except that where it's occurring in the, in, the, in the map of the lung is one's occurring at a large lung volume, one's occurring at a low lung volume. So here's the thing, let's move on to the, to, to the, so the purpose of me showing you this chart is to tell you that how you breathe is very important and part of you know, how you breathe, we want to raise your awareness of how you breathe. So initially, we want to make you very aware of your breathing, okay?
okay? So that ultimately you can do more things and your body can be get better and then you can become less aware of your breathing. So let's go to the actual techniques. Before we go to the techniques, anyone have any questions? All right, so here's the technique, yes? Pulmonary fibrosis means that there's scar tissue around the lung, okay? So the lungs become stiff, and so when the diaphragm contracts down, the wall that doesn't allow you to take that breath in is a hard scar tissue. That's pulmonary fibrosis. So let's talk techniques, okay? When you come here the first time, or the second time, we try to teach you these techniques that you're going to use for exercise. And again, the goal is for you to start using these techniques before you need them, okay? We want to raise your awareness of breathing. So number one, okay, and I'm going to go slightly out of order because the, the real first one I want to talk about, which is diaphragmatic breathing, you need the second one, which is purse lip breathing, right? Everyone here familiar with purse lip breathing? How many people are? Okay, how many people are? Okay, so purse lip breathing, like it sounds, you purse your lips, you put your lips together, you blow out gently, okay? One thing you probably notice is that when you're short of breath, this is what you're doing. You're working very hard to push air out. But what you don't know, or what's not intuitive, is the fact that the harder you work, the more air traffic you can get, the more bronchospasm you get, and so the harder you work, the harder you have to work. So the first thing is, when you feel like you're starting to get short of breath, or ideally before you get short of breath, okay, you're gonna to talk to yourself, okay? And when you start going, oh my God, what's happening? I'm so short of breath, and you go, and that's this whole cycle of adrenaline is kicking in. You need to talk to yourself. Just like when you're here, we talk to you, okay? We go, stupid, no, just kidding. <laughs> but you have to talk to yourself. You say to yourself, stop. I know what to do here, because you know what to do, okay? Everybody, just for one second, stop what you're doing, take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth through purse lips. Does anybody feel different after that one breath? I feel out of breath. Okay, you feel out of breath. You did it wrong, I'm gonna teach you how to do it right. All right, so purse lip breathing, here's the point. If I tell you that blowing out is a difficult thing, the hard, if I tell you that the harder you blow out, okay, the more difficult, you, the more you have to work, what I want you to do is I want you to breathe in through your nose. Instead of blowing hard, I want you to just get in a slit to let the air come out gently, okay? We talked about the diaphragm being the main muscle of inspiration. Expiration is supposed to be passive, okay? Meaning that you shouldn't have to use any muscle to do it. The natural recoil of the lungs should be enough to deflate it. But when you have pulmonary disease, that natural recoil is gone, okay? So what you need to do is nice deep breath in through your nose, out gently through your mouth, and avoid the dizzy Gillespie, okay? So don't go, because when you do that, the air goes into your cheeks. What we want, we want you to keep your cheeks relatively tight, because then what happens is a back pressure is created that goes all the way back down the pulmonary tree and helps keep the airways and the alveoli open and prevents them from collapsing. I kind of like the mnemonic, smell the roses, blow out the candle. A lot of people do say that. They say, smell the roses, blow out the candle. But here's what I don't like about blow out the candle, okay, is this. I don't want you to do that. I'd rather you smell the roses and cool the soup. <laughs> Because if you're blowing that soup off, okay, if you're blowing out, that blowing out that candle is the best way to get your lungs to collapse or get your airways to narrow, okay? So you go, you, that's why you ever see someone do this, you ever see them blow out the cake and they go, and then they're wheezing afterwards, that's because that's creating that air traffic. So breathe in through your nose, smell the roses by all means. Don't blow out the candles. Cool the soup, okay? Question. And when we're exercising here. Yes. We're breathing quite rapidly, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, when, when do you want us to breathe, to ex exhale slowly? All the time, ideally, okay? And it's not a perfect scenario. So in other words, you're not going to be walking like this and breathing like this. 
the more that way. Okay? So at a certain point, you got to step it up. But we want to time it with your breathing. Okay? I'm sorry, with your activity. So in other words, we tell you to breathe in for a count of two out for a count of four. Why is that? Particularly with people with pulmonary disease, the hard part is the exhalation. Okay? So we want you to breathe in. That's an active process. The diaphragm contracts fast and you know expands the lungs. Exhalation is slower. So you have to take your time with that. Create a slit, let the air come out. So that's, that what I just talked about is first lip breathing, okay? And the other thing is that when you're doing that, when you're breathing in through your nose, you should also be doing diaphragmatic breathing. So as you breathe in through your nose, what should be happening, and, and everybody just put your hands on your stomach, okay, and feel this. When you breathe in, your diaphragm should be contracting downward, pushing your stomach out. So in other words, you breathe in, stomach should come out. You blow out, Stomach should go in. Breathe in. Blow out. And this takes practice, okay? Again, most people don't think about using their diaphragm, okay? So initially, start doing these exercises, okay, as just a breathing exercise where you sit, you find some quiet time, and eventually you say, another good position for using the diaphragm, side line, okay? So lie on your side, and that'll take the gravity away, and that'll help you use your contract your diaphragm better. But first lip breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, so where you're breathing in through your nose for a count of two, out through your mouth for a count of four, so it looks like this. Breathe in, in, and blow, two, three, four. So breathe in, in, blow, two, three, four. So. And then we're gonna do the last technique, which is called Pace breathing, okay? And that's where we're gonna time it with our activity. So let's use walking as an example, okay? If you're walking on, on Fifth Avenue and you're about to come from 34th Street to 36th Street, that's an uphill, okay? So what most people do is they go, ah, oh, the uphill, yeah. And they trudge up the hill and they get to the top of the hill and then they go, <laughs> and they have to stop, okay? So what I wanna get you to be able to do is when this happens, okay, is I want you to plan ahead. So when you see that hill, say, all right, I'm gonna do my breathing now, and time it with your walking. So each step is a count. So breathe in, in, and blow, two, three, four. Breathe. So you're just saying two excels for every one inhale? That's the ratio. So a ratio of one to two between inhalation and exhalation. Now, if you're fitter, okay, some people are fitter, you may be able to do in for three and out for six, okay? But when it gets tough, in for two and out for four. You don't want to do in for one and out for two because then the air doesn't get into your lungs. So you want to be able to take a nice deep breath, in, in, bring that air into your lungs, out, two, three, four, okay? Question. I live in the Bronx, which is very hilly. Yeah. Lots of stairs, you know, very steep. Uh, is, there, is there something you should do about, like, when, you, when your foot hits the next level, should you? Well, there's a yourself? couple of ways you can do it, okay? Stair climbing is, is difficult. That's what it is. It's one of the most difficult things you can do. So, the, this is going from the most fit to the least fit, okay? So, if you're pretty fit, you can take these stairs and, and you know maybe you walk up one foot over the other. Some people walk up one step and they just step to it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. But it, it, using that same principle, you could walk in, in, blow, two, three, four. Okay, and here's another way. If I want to take one step at a time, I could breathe in, in, blow, two, three, four as I step up. So breathe. Okay, another way of doing it, you can do it at each step. Okay, so in, breathe in, and always try to exhale on the exertion. Okay, but we can talk about these principles more at another time. I want to do just one more thing for about three minutes, and then Cindy is going to do a, uh, a 15 minute exercise with you um, on relaxation. Um, so, the last thing is recovery from shortness of breath. Okay, very often you're out in the street and you're in a jam, and even if you stop, you're still short of breath. Okay? So we talked about the accessory muscles of breathing, right? Anyone have trouble with overhead activities? So washing your hair, I hear a lot, bathing, okay, combing my hair. The reason is because 
when you use your arms, okay, there's muscles of your chest, your back, and your all these muscles within your thorax. When the arms are open like this, this is called open chain activity, okay? So the chest's job is to do this, okay? The back's job is to do this, or to do this. The shoulder's job is to do this, okay? This is open chain. But when you're short of breath, okay, a lot of people you'll notice this position is a help, right? And the reason for that is because whether you do that or whether you're sitting in a chair and you put your elbows on your knees, that's something that we ask people to do a lot. Um, so we'll say, can, can I just use that chair for one second, please? I'm sorry. Sure. So a lot of times if somebody's short of breath, when they sit down, and, and you can sit down and still be short of breath. So this is called fixing your upper body. You put your elbows on your knees and you lean forward. And what this does is this drops the abdominal contents out of the way. Because remember, underneath the diaphragm is the stomach, okay? Yeah. And so this allows the stomach to move out of the way so the diaphragm can contract easier. And then by fixing the arms, okay, the effect of that is to allow the chest muscles, the back muscles, and the, the serratus muscles and the, the intercostals to work in their reverse activity. And then instead of moving this, this stays still and it moves the ribs up and down, okay? So what I advise you when you are short of breath, okay, if it's in the street, Try to find some place that you can lean against, okay? Lean against the wall, put your hands on your, on your legs like this, keep your elbows straight. Again, this position allows my abdominal contents to drop down. My upper, my upper extremities being fixed allow to help the rib cage. And then breathe. And that will help you regain your shortness of breath quicker. So to reiterate, and I'm going to turn it over to Cynthia, and then if people have questions afterwards, I will answer more questions, uh, you know, as, as long as you want. But again, pursed lip breathing, okay, so breathing in through your nose, out gently through pursed lips, paced breathing, timing it with your exercise, in for a count of two, out for a count of four, and then recovery from shortness of breath. All the steps are in there, okay? If you have questions, you know I'll probably be cleaning the fish tanks during the week. So now I'm going...